Well, this morning I'm excited about this new series. It's a series that may go five or six weeks. I've called it His Love, His Light, His Life, a series in 1 John. And as we look at this series and as we look at this book, 1 John, together, we're going to be asking, is 1 John about believers bouncing around in the light, sometimes in the light, sometimes in the darkness, sometimes being forgiven, and sometimes not, sometimes being in fellowship, and sometimes not. Unfortunately, the most popular take on this epistle in the Bible is that, yes, Christians are bouncing all around, in and out, in and out of fellowship, in and out, in and out of the light, in and out, in and out of forgiveness. We're going to see today and in the weeks to come that that was never God's intention for His children. That was never the King's intention for His kingdom. Instead, we've been invited to something unshakable and unbreakable and incredible. And we begin in 1 John chapter 1, the very first verse. He says... What was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes and what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. You might think an opening verse like this is insignificant. You might think, oh, he's just introducing the letter. Perhaps it's a rare form of greeting. He's just going to introduce the idea of Jesus and so he flowers it up a bit. Well, this sort of greeting, this sort of introduction is on purpose. And I've highlighted the words here in yellow. I'm a big fan of yellow. And as you look at these words, you're going to see what John is after. There are people in this early church who are saying that Jesus was not physical. There are people in this early church it's an early form of a philosophy called Gnosticism. And the Gnostics believed in secret knowledge, in Gnosos. That they had this secret Gnosos knowledge. And that if you would come be part of their movement, they could teach you this secret knowledge and unlock the mysteries of the world that they lived in. And you could live on a higher plane. You could live as a spiritual being who did not need to succumb to the ways of the body and the ways of the physical world. You could sort of live up in your spirit, negating everything that is around you. Now with that nonsense, and that's what it is because God created us body, soul, and spirit. He created the body with its five senses, with its appetite, he created and instituted marriage, which some were forbidding because it was fleshly or worldly. But you see, the Creator God wanted the polar opposite. He wanted us to live to the fullest body, soul, and spirit, not negating an entire third of our existence. And so, John opens the letter this way to show that this false idea that the physical doesn't matter is rubbish, that it's garbage. And they were, these Gnostics were saying that because we need to live up in our spirit, we need to live in the spiritual realm only, they were saying that Jesus never would have shown up on this earth with a real physical human body because God, this mystic, spiritual, far-off God, would never stoop so low to take on human flesh. And so John blasts them. From the very beginning of his letter, he blasts them and he tells them, no, this Jesus was indeed physical. We heard him. The, the, the sound waves hit the canal of our ear. We heard Him. We saw Him. We touched Him with our hands. So your theory, your faulty theory that you could just sort of put your hand right through Him, 
that he was an illusion, that he was a projection beam, all of that falls to the wayside, is dashed against the rocks, and is proven wrong because the disciples, John being one of them, walked with him and talked with him and hugged him and leaned up against him at the Last Supper. He was physical, just like us. Now, why is John doing this? It's not just to prove that Jesus was physical. But as we get further in this chapter, here's what we're going to see. As we get further in this chapter, he is not only going to bash the idea that Jesus wasn't physical, but he is also going to bash the Gnostic idea that sin isn't real or that sin doesn't matter. You see, they were pulling two punches here. They had a punch on the right and a punch on the left. And here it was, their doctrine had two prongs to it. Jesus was never physical because the physical is lowly and doesn't matter. And sin is not real because it happens in the physical world which doesn't matter anyway. Sin, what sin? Sin, oh, that's just an amateur, beginner Christianity term. You need to graduate into the nosos and experience higher knowledge. Do you see what they were doing? Negating the physicality of Jesus and negating the reality of sin all at one time. And so as we watch then John's argument throughout this chapter, he's going to hit both ideas and dash them to pieces. Verse 2, the life that is Jesus, the life was manifested. We have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This is no coincidence. These words are no coincidence. Again, he is using physical words to show them there's no doubt about it. You could hug Jesus. You could hold Him. You could grab Him around the neck. And give him a big bear hug. He was just like us. Fully physical. And yet fully God as well. Verse 3. More of the same. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us. Hang on to that phrase. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. Right here. Until this very slide, until this verse, until this moment, most preachers and teachers of the gospel, most would agree with everything we have said thus far. And yet at this point, the departure begins. What they will begin to say is that everything you are about to read is addressed to Christians and that Christians are going in and out of fellowship All the time. Monday at 3 o'clock, you blow it. You're out of fellowship with God. But then, lo and behold, you give your confession. You turn from your ways. You make your promises. You go to church. You do your devotions. You witness to somebody. Whatever the formula is, you're back in. And now you're in fellowship for three more hours until you blow it. Never mind that he said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Never mind that. Never mind that he said nothing separates you from the love of God. Never mind that. Never mind when he said if we deny him, he will never deny us because he cannot deny himself and he lives in us. Never mind all that. You're out of fellowship. You see, we invent our own Christian religion based on what we grew up with in church, how our dad or mom treated us what we experienced in school with conditional relationships. How many times have you been talking about the grace of God and the forgiveness of God, and someone has said, yeah, but? Have you ever heard that? Am I the only one? Yeah, but? I say, wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't, don't be a but. <laughs> don't, don't be a but, Christian. Just be a yeah, Christian. Don't do the yeah, but. Just do the yeah. But you see, they're saying, yeah, but, and then they throw in their family analogy. But when my kids, 
Are you God? <laughs> yeah, but when my child... Did you die for your kid on a cross? Is there a blood economy between you and your kids? Because you're about to tell me an analogy. And the bottom line is that I should equate my God with you. Is my God not greater than you? Has my God not done more for my sins than you have? Then perhaps we should take the way that we go about family relationships and elevate them Forgiving others as God forgave us instead of trying to take our flavor of forgiveness and infusing it on the God of the universe. It is backwards. It is upside down. And it makes no sense. Amen. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you. Is he really about to tell Christians they're in and out of fellowship? No, look at what he's saying. He's saying our goal is that you, the recipients of this letter, we hope, we pray that you will come to have fellowship with us. Meaning, not all of you know Jesus yet. Our prayer, it would make our joy complete. It would thrill us to no end if you would come to Jesus Christ and as a result of your being saved, guess what would happen? You would be grafted into the body of Jesus Christ and then you would have fellowship with us. And guess what? Let me tell you who our fellowship is with. See, this is John writing. He's talking about him and his fellow believers and his fellow apostles. He is saying, we hope that you too will have fellowship with us. And our fellowship, me and my buddies here, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you see what he's saying? Does he say our fellowship is sometimes with the Father, sometimes with Jesus, depending on how we're doing? Now, if you do a word study of the word fellowship in the New Testament, you will not find one single instance of Christians going in and out and in and out of fellowship. If you want to choose sin, you're going to have to choose sin bringing Jesus right along with you. That's why it's not as much fun anymore, is it? You got that new heart, and you got the God of the universe with you, and you set out in your day, I'm just going to go out and see Him. And that lasts about five minutes and there's a stirring in your heart and it's you and it's God and it's you and it's God and it's both of you because you agree in heart. You agree with Him. He took out your heart of stone and gave you a new heart. You and He agree. Christian, here's that secret again. You don't really want to sin. You think you want to sin when the enemy dupes you and tricks you into thinking you want to sin and then five minutes later you're going... What, what, what happened? How did I get in this spot? And you want out and you want something different and your heart craves, your heart longs for the higher calling that is your only calling. And so what he's saying here is we've preached a message and me and my fellow apostles, we know this message. In fact, many have believed and been saved and we pray and hope that you too, recipients of this letter, that you too may have fellowship with us. How? By crossing over from darkness to light. You lack fellowship, but in Christ you will gain fellowship. You are in darkness, but by crossing over you will be in light. You are in error, but by crossing over you will be in the truth forever. Now he continues... These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you. That God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. Such an important verse for what is about to come. We are about to see contrasts. You know what a contrast is? It's two things that stand in opposition. We are about to see a major contrast... I've already alluded to it, is the contrast between light and darkness, the contrast between saved and unsaved, the contrast between truth and error. And the reason that John is going to go into all of this is he wants them to know who's in 
Who's teaching the truth? And who is teaching crazy Gnostic garbage? That's what he wants them to know. And so he announces that if you're on God's team, God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. So guess what? If you're on God's team, guess what you're called? We are the light of the world. No, no, Jesus. Yeah, he was before us, but he included us and allowed us and permitted us and invited us so that we become children of light. We are the light of the world. Those are his words, not ours. And so God is light. There's no darkness in him. He is about to make this contrast and you need to see that there's no gray area. There's no half light. You turn on the light, it's on. The light is on or off. It's not half on. It's not half off. Now, here's this contrast beginning in the next verse. The contrast begins right here. Light versus darkness. Truth versus error. Lost versus saved. Again, let me step back and let's get the big picture. Why are we needing such clarity here? Because you as a Christian don't spend five minutes in light and five minutes in darkness. You don't spend five minutes saved and five minutes lost. This is not about a Christian's bouncing in and bouncing out of experience. Instead, it is a contrast between lost and saved. We begin with the unsaved. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Are we in God? If this is true of us, are we in God? How much darkness is in God? There is no darkness at all in God. Is there any darkness in Christ? There's no darkness in Christ. So if this is true of us, then we are not in Christ. We are not in the light. But you'll notice the third word of this verse. You'll notice that it says, if we say that we have fellowship. That's done on purpose. There were people, these Gnostics, these heretics, these Looney Tunes, they were saying that they had fellowship. They were saying, I'm a Christian just like you. Now come to my movement and I will teach you Christianity plus. I will teach you life on the higher plane. I will teach you the secret nosos. And then you will have Jesus plus the secret knowledge and you will be a better off for it. And so he is letting them know that there are imposters. There are tricksters. And he's putting it politely, and perhaps this is the two-letter word that makes it difficult for many to gain clarity from this passage, the word we. Every time we see the word we in the Bible, we think it's Christians. Sometimes the word we means humans. You know, the idea that these apostles are evangelistic should be pretty evident. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, today if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Oh no, but He's only writing Christians. He's only writing Christians. They're all saved. So none of those verses can be to convert. Oh really? So none of the apostles had a heart of an evangelist. None of them desired that people would come to salvation. Of course, that is nonsense. The Bible, the New Testament, is loaded with pitches to turn and believe, repent and be saved, fixing your eyes on Jesus for new life in Him. This is no different. What we're about to see in this next string of verses, it is not a bar of soap for Christians. Many people have used this passage as a bar of soap for Christians. The idea is that you committed 28 sins yesterday... And so last night, you were to kneel, put your head on your bed, and you were to pray to God and ask Him for forgiveness for each one, all 28, God forbid, if you forget one. And then, through some magical process never described in Scripture, He will swoop down into that bedroom, and He will forgive you in that moment and cleanse you in that moment, he will douse you with something. Some say blood, some say water. Who knows, a blood and water mix. 
But he is going to miraculously intervene every single time you confess, swooping down and giving you today's forgiveness in installments. Now, that might be taught in a lot of popular religious circles, but it is not the truth. It is not the truth. The truth is that all of your sins were in the future when Christ died. Your past sins... Your present sins, your future sins. When Jesus hung on that cross way back here, all of your sins were in the future when Christ died. And He did not say, I will forgive these but not these. I will forgive these but not these. These are taken away by the blood, but these are taken away by apologies. These are taken away by blood, but these are taken away by tears. Not the truth. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for tears. Many times I've deeply regretted sins I've committed. God has counseled me to turn away from those sins, to act differently, to adopt new attitudes. Turning away from sins is the most sensible, healthy thing a Christian can do. But for me to stand there and believe that my action somehow activates the blood, my action somehow causes Jesus to be put in motion to bring more forgiveness, I'm mixing two things that don't need to be mixed. We need to separate the forgiveness from our choices. You are not making yourself forgiven. Jesus made you forgiven. Let's turn from sin every single time, but not in order to be forgiven. Do you see it? He forgave you on the cross, through the cross, not because of your memory and your legal pad and your ability to drum up 28 confessions on a Tuesday evening. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. This is a description of those tricksters Those Gnostic heretics who are duping the church. Now, watch this, this contrast. But, here come the believers. But, if we walk where? In the light. Are you in the light? Yes, you are in the light. Are you in Christ? Yes, if you are a new creation, you are a new creation in Christ. You are in the light. Now, how much of you is in the light? Look what he says, as he himself is in the light. You see, this is not an effort. Oh, i got to try my hardest. Let me finish the passage. If this is true of us, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from how much? All sin. Now, what kind of in is this? You see that John defined it for us. This is the same kind of in as Jesus. Is Jesus in the light? Jesus is in the light. If you are in the light just as Jesus is in the light. You see, that's all or nothing. You can't be Jesus. You can't try your best to walk like Jesus and attain 100% of anything. We can't do it. So this is about a status, a location that we are in because of God's grace. We are in the light, walking around. No matter where I walk, if I'm in Christ, I'm always in Christ. And so we are in Christ. We are in the light just as Jesus is in the light. And then what does he say? As a result... If we are sin admitters instead of those sin deniers over there, then guess what? We have been welcomed into the church. We are grafted into the body of Christ. We have fellowship with whom? With one another. This is not about God turning His back in a swivel chair until you do your devotions again. This is not about an in and out experience with the God of the universe. This is about, are you part of the church? Are you part of the body of Christ? Or are you still denying that sin even exists? Now he flips back again to contrast darkness with light. Here we see unsaved. 
If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Is the truth in you? Is the truth in you? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth resides in you and in fact will be with you forever. Ah, eh, we need a second opinion. Let's get a second opinion from John, the same author, and now a different epistle. Is the truth in Christians? Yes. Here it is as 2 John opens. The elder to the lady chosen by God and her children. Is this directly directed at Christians? Yes, it is. To the lady chosen by God and to her children. This is directed at, aimed right at believers. Look at what it says. Whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth. Here it comes. How beautiful, how clear. Here it is. Because of the truth which lives where? In us. But maybe it'd be in and out. Who knows? Wait. Will be with us how long? Forever. The truth is in you. The truth will be with you forever. Now, back to the story. So, who are these people in verse 8 that do not have the truth in them and say that they have no sin? If I introduce you to my good buddy Bob and I say, let me tell you a little bit about Bob. And you say, what about Bob? And I say, well, let me tell you about Bob. Now, Bob doesn't have the truth in him. Bob is deceiving himself. Bob says he has no sin at all. Bob says he's never sinned a day in his life. Now, you shake my friend Bob's hand and you walk away. Do you conclude that he's a believer? Of course not. Bob just said he's never sinned a day in his life. He has no sin. He says he's deceiving himself. And the truth, which is Jesus, does not live in Bob. So what does Bob need? Bob needs a reality check, man. Bob is bonkers. He is off base. He is in la-la land. He needs a serious confrontation. And that's exactly what John gives to people like Bob 2,000 years ago. So we got our second opinion. The truth is in us and will be with us forever. That's believers. And then John continues in his first chapter with the infamous verse that's been used as a bar of soap. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does this mean now? Well, together with verse 8, it should be pretty clear. Are you a person that's deceiving yourself, saying that you've never sinned a day in your life, saying that you have no sin at all? Are you like my friend Bob? Well, if you're like my friend Bob, let me teach you about the crossover to getting saved. Here it is. Bob, listen, you have been denying your sinfulness. You've been saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. You've been saying that you have no sin. You've been saying that you're just spotless, that sin doesn't matter. There's no such thing as sin. You've never sinned a day in your life. Bob, listen, man. If we, any one of us, will come to our senses and just admit our sinfulness, guess what he'll do? He will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, Bob, I've experienced that. Wouldn't you like to have fellowship with me and with the Lord Jesus Christ? Bob says, well, I mean, now that you mention it, I guess, yeah, I mean, if there's a way toward forgiveness, sure, I mean, I'll, I'll come clean. I'll admit, yeah, I've done lots of stuff wrong. Okay, Bob, well, now, we're, now we've hit step one. Now, let me tell you about a Jesus who doesn't forgive you in installments. Let me tell you about a Jesus who forgives you and cleanses you of all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness have you been cleansed of, church? All unrighteousness. This is an invitation to repent and believe unto salvation. This is not a bar of soap for Christians. 
Once again, he makes the final contrast in this chapter. But if we're going to persist and be like Bob, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. So let me get this straight then. Two kinds of people, a contrast. Either we don't have the word in us, we don't have the truth in us, we're deniers of sin, or we do have the word in us, we do have the truth in us, and we've been cleansed of all unrighteousness. It's all or nothing. There's no gray area, no middle ground. It's about darkness or light, death or life, error or truth. Are you in the truth If you're in Jesus, you are in the truth and in the light. Well, as a finale for today's chapter, let's get another second opinion from John. This is his second chapter. It'll come up next week. As believers, have our sins already been forgiven? Same epistle. Same book of the Bible. One chapter later. I am writing to you little children. What do you think that means? Little children in the faith. I am writing to you little children because your sins might be forgiven, could be forgiven, will be forgiven if you ask every single time. No, he says, I'm writing you little children because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. Is this some sort of chaotic belief system that's going to lead to more sin? The Bible says the opposite. The Bible says the grace of God teaches us to say no to sin. Jesus said, He who has been forgiven much loves much. And guess what? This message is that we have been forgiven much. That's going to lead to us loving much. And by the way, love covers a multitude of sins. Doesn't sound like we're going to be setting world records for sin anytime soon. Apparently, God was not naive when He gave us this grace and He gave us this limitless forgiveness. He was not naive. He knew what He was doing. The grace of God inspires beyond belief. Is 1 John about believers bouncing around in the light and the darkness, sometimes being forgiven and sometimes not, sometimes being in fellowship and sometimes not. That's the question we asked at the beginning of this message. The answer is no. We are in fellowship and we are forgiven. So let's thank our God. Father, we thank you that we are in the light, that if we have called upon the name of Jesus Christ, that he is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we are in the light. Father, we thank you for that reality. We thank you for that simple truth that we are forgiven people, that you have cleansed us of all unrighteousness, that we are in fellowship with you now and forever. Father, sin is just no fun anymore when we set our minds on this truth. We thank you that sin never really met our need to begin with, but you do. You meet every need. We're complete in you. We lack nothing. You are our everything. We ate and we drank in remembrance of Jesus Christ, and we fix our eyes on him now. We celebrate Him and all that He is to us. He is our everything. In His name we pray. Amen.